Alright, so in another video we looked at something called the second moment of arrow, which is basically a beam's resistance to bending around a particular axis. So um, this time, in this particular video, we are going to look for po polar moment of inertia for area. The second, mo we also call it the second moment of area, but it's for polar, like around a specific, ac around a, uh, I'll show you. You'll see what I'm talking about. But basically what we're going to do is previously we would look at something like this, and that would be like the x-axis running through here. And we would say, okay, well, ix is going to be equal to the integral of y squared dA, and that would be a measurement of how easily it's going to bend around the x-axis. Or we would say, no, here's the y-axis, and so we could say that Iy was equal to da-da-da-da x squared dA, and that would be its resistance to bending around the, um, around the y-axis. Well, things can do stuff besides bend around axes. What they actually could do is, if I'm looking at this from this particular direction, so things could try to bend one way or the other, and that would be fine, but really another thing we have to worry about is it twisting, okay? So um, that's what the polar moment measures, is actually its resistance, the, the beam's resistance to twisting around the central axis, which in this case would be Z, okay? Kind of see what's going on? So essentially what we're going to do is, I'm going to make this a little bit, a, a little clean drawing to play with, but say we've got this as a cross section of the beam, and if you missed the discussion of the second moment of area, I would not view this video first. I'd go watch the second moment of area one first and then come back to this one because they're kind of really super duper dependent upon each other. So again, this is a cross section of a beam that looks like this. And let's say we did some kind of a beam analysis and we found that at some point there was going to be a torque, internal torque to that beam. So this is all about the what's going on inside the beam, what kind of stresses are going on inside the beam. Okay, so, and it doesn't matter if we do an I-beam or any kind of general shape, so I'm just going to have a random, random shape, um, but I'm always going to be twisting around the geometric center, so this is going to be always and always and always the centroid, and it has to be the geometric center, because if something is going to twist, it's going to twist around its center, because that's the point at which the area is equally distributed around it, does that kind of make sense? So it would be really, really weird if this I-beam twisted around this point, that would make no sense, or if the I-beam twisted around this point. It's going to twist. If it's going to twist, it's going to twist around its center. Okay, so basically what we're going to do is kind of a cute little uh, calculus approach and say, okay, well, if we have all these moments, I thought you said there was only one moment. Well, yeah, but it's, it's applying. It's not like the moment is just applying to the exterior. There's a moment that it's applying here, and it's applying here, and it's applying here. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to turn that moment instead of describing it as a moment, we're going to describe it as a force. So you might have a little force, and then a bigger force, and then a smaller force, you know, because you're further away from the center. So to get the same moment, if you have a, um, yeah, basically you're going to have a uh, torque that is dependent upon, uh, upon the moment, because this guy is going to have to push harder or faster to get all the way around than this guy. Okay, so you're going to have uh, less deformation closer in. And so just like we did in previous versions of this, what we're going to say is this is going to be proportional to some distance from the center um, times the, well, the pressure times the, um, times the area around. So then if I'm going to look at the sum of the moments, or the moment about the z-axis, if I look at the moment about the z-axis, I'm going to have some, well, I'll do the df first, but I'll say it's some r away times df. Okay, so that would be the itty bitty moment would be the R times the DF, and so then again, I can integrate to get RDF, and since I know what R is, it's R, doo -doo -doo. I mean, what I know what DF is, it's this thingy, doo -doo -doo. and then I've got um, a thingy with the little alpha, beta, ga gamma out front, R squared DA. Okay, so this right here, this is called the polar moment. And whenever we call it the polar moment, instead of calling it I, we could call it IZ is okay. Um, or what most people end up doing is calling it J naught. And that's because it's kind of measuring something a little bit different. It is, it is, the, so you could say, well, it's the bending around the Z axis. But if you have bending around the Z axis, what that really is, is torsion. So essentially what you have is that J naught, the polar moment, is the measure of a beam's ability to resist torsion. Just like in the in the case of the second moment of area, you would have some kind of uh, torsional stress, some kind of torsional stress, and it is defined as a torsional max times
times the radius over j naught. So again, this, just like the second moment, this would be, say, meters squared and meters squared, so you get meters to the fourth. Um, the force, or the torsion, that is, it's not a force, it's a, it's a moment, um, would be in newton meters, and the radius would, of course, be in meters as well, and then you're divided by there, and so you're still getting that same kind of stress, the newtons per meter squared. So again, in statics, you don't do this part, um, we only focus on just calculating the value, but I think it's important for you to understand where the where the value is going to end up being used because in statics it's just kind of like this very very like arbitrary blah 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 thing. Okay, so um, one more thing that's important to note is that if I have this lovely little thingy here, except I can't draw very well. <laughs> if I have this lovely little thing here, and um, I have any kind of R, so whatever R I happen, I'm just not good at connecting those things. Um, if I have some kind of R here, that I can rewrite the R in terms of X and Y, right? And I know that, you know, X squared plus Y squared is R squared because, you know, I've, I've made it through basic geometry and I'm super awesome at basic geometry. And so if I have the polar moment, and I know that the polar moment is given by R squared dA, well, I can go ahead and I can substitute in for R squared, X squared plus Y squared dA, and then because I can separate things out in integration, then I have the integral of x squared dA plus the integral of y squared dA. And so um, essentially what I can do is instead of calculating uh, the polar moment every time, what I can do is I can just calculate the um, second moment of area in the x direction around the x axis and the second moment of area around the the y-axis. So it's really kind of nice that it's just a linear combination of the other two. It does save you some time, but again, what you want to be thinking is that this is the resistance resisting to torsion. And again, the greater the value of that J-naught, the greater the resistance to torsion.